Okay, thank you, Asha. How are you guys doing? Good? All right. Um, my name's Jack. We're going to talk about moonshots. When we talk about moonshots, what do people think? Anyone just shout out any word that comes to your mind. Moonshots. You thinking what? What? The moon. Good. Excellent. Yeah. 100x? World hunger? World peace? Good. All right. Good. Excellent. So that's what we're going to talk about today. These things that appear impossible, appear, appear very, very difficult to do. Uh, and there's a lot of examples of moonshots. I'll give a few examples today. Specifically, we're going to go deep today into AI and physics. Are you guys ready for a very technical talk? Yeah. Yes. OK, good. If there's any place we can do technical, it's at Tycon. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, all right. We're going to talk about the future of AI, and also I'm going to delve into the realm of physics and the quantum. I'm not here to represent Google and all announcements from Google and things like that. If you want any announcements about Google and information about Google, we just had the Google I.O. 2019. Anyone here go to 2019? OK. Um, check it out online. All the videos are free. It's all out there. I'm not the person to do that. There's many other people at Google who do that. If you want to find out about that, check that out. I'm here just in my personal capacity to share with you my excitement, my passion for these kinds of moonshots. I first got started with moonshots at XPRIZE. What was the first XPRIZE? Anyone know the XPRIZE for what? To go where? Ansari XPRIZE. Ansari XPRIZE for space. OK. We have some ringers in the audience, I can see. Um, and that was a $10 million prize. Uh, 21 teams competed. And together, they spent about $120 million. So you can see already the leverage that Moonshot, uh, Moonshot activity brings in. And sure enough, one of the teams, Burt Rattan's team, did create a vehicle that went to space twice in two weeks with a human and won the $10 million prize. And that now became the company called Virgin Galactic. Virgin Galactic, that's right. So Virgin Galactic came to the winning team, Burt Rattan's team, and said, wow, congratulations, you won that prize from XPRIZE. We'd like now to license that technology and make Virgin Galactic. Within the next two years, I'm hearing from uh, George and the team at, uh, at Virgin Galactic that people in this room and others will be going to space. So it's an exciting moment to see the fruition of that. Um, Anusha Ansari and her family endowed that prize. And Anusha is now the CEO of XPRIZE. And so it's great to see that activity. One of the other prizes right now is Global Learning Prize. Global Learning Prize is a $15 million prize. And that really hits the 400 million people, uh, adults, who cannot read, and the 400 million children who don't have good literacy. And so the prize is $15 million. And everyone gets the same tablet. It's a very, very inexpensive tablet that has a camera and basic stuff on it, uh, like a tablet this size. And the prize is for the software. Can, you, can your team develop software that a child or an adult on their own with no instruction, no teacher, can teach themselves how to read, write, and do basic math? And that is going on right now. It's a very, very exciting prize. So that's another example of a world-changing moonshot thinking. Can we teach 800 million people to read with no teachers? And that's happening right now. There were 10 finalists announced. And the biggest prize is being announced very soon. So I want to now talk about um, how, in part, I came to have a very deep connection with the people and the land of India. And that was through, initially, the X Prize. I don't think I have to introduce who's on this slide. Um, Ratan is also on the board with us. I'm on the board of trustees of X Prize. Ratan is on the board with us. And so via various board meetings, I got to know him. I'm not his best friend, but just got to know him. And one day he said, Jack, I think it'd be good for you to visit, come to India, You've never been to India. Come to India and visit a few of my companies. Now, at that time, I didn't really understand what he was saying. I figured maybe he has five or six companies, maybe seven, maybe eight. And all I can tell you is that over the course of the next months and years, I've only been able to visit about 20% of the Tata companies. Um, I have been to Tanishq stores to buy jewelry. Um, I have checked out plantation fields to check out the tea in the south. Uh, of course, been to the Tata Motors and Tata Steel and Tata Communications and TCS and things like that. And then one day they call me saying, Jack, very urgent, very, very urgent, just like Asha called me, very urgent you come and speak in 10 days' time in India. So if you had no problem, I'll probably fly to Mumbai. I'll stay at my home away from home in Mumbai, which is, you can guess, is the what? The Taj Land's End, of course, right? Bandra West. Um, and... Uh, and I'll go and give the speech. Uh, I didn't really focus on the details. 
And when I landed, I realized, no, I was not going to uh, the Taj Land's End. Instead, the conference was being held um, here in this houseboat in Trivandrum in Kerala. Um, actually, no, we held it in a Taj Hotel very nearby, but we did have a number of events on the houseboat. So I got to explore all of Kerala. I've been to Kerala four times in the last few years. Uh, just with the various Tata family of companies. Very interesting to visit Kochi and Trivandrum and many, many cities that I've visited now uh, in that area. So uh, it's been wonderful to get to know the country, to get to know the people. I've been to many Thais um, all around India, not just the Thai Khan India, but also many local chapters. Uh, and it's wonderful to go to each local chapter and talk with the people and understand what the ecosystem is in that particular city. So we've done that in about seven cities now uh, around, around India. So let me talk about other kinds of moonshots. We talked about XPRIZE moonshots. At X, we also use uh, moonshot thinking, moonshot technology. We go after the big problems. We go after the grand challenges. The grand challenges are the challenges that face all of us as humans and as a planet. Uh, we think about, someone mentioned world hunger before. So food, sustainable food for the whole planet, sustainable energy for the planet, uh, life sciences, healthcare, medicine. Obviously, these are major issues. Logistics and getting people and goods to move around of the world in different ways. Uh, telecommunications. Uh, how many people of 7.3 billion people today on Earth, how many people of 7.3 billion people are connected today to the internet? Any guesses? I'll start the bidding at 2 billion. 2 billion are connected. More? More? OK, we have three there. Someone raises three. OK, three and a half, right. So four, OK, it's about three and a half billion. About half are connected today. Now, the internet started around 1969, right? ARPANET started in 1969. So it took about 50 years, 50 years to connect half the planet. Now, guesses, please. How many more years will it take to connect the next 3 billion people? Not everybody, but the next 3 billion, next 3B, next 3 billion. How many years? I, I'll take guesses at five years. OK, four, what, two? All right, we have a lot of optimism here. Good, OK. So my personal, this is not a Google thing. This is my personal best guess is four years. My, my guess is within four years of this Taikon, so let's come back, Asha, to Taikon four years from now, and let's check the numbers. But I think it's going to happen. When you land in India, what happens? Um, you see all around you, wherever you're going, the Palladium Mall, anywhere you're going, you're seeing um, uh, very inexpensive mobile phones that you can now get for under $20. You can get phones with cameras and smartphones and things like that. And I think that India alone will probably add about 400 million people with smartphone access. So there's already a billion subscribers in, in India with basic cell phone access. Now I'm talking about smartphone access, so you can access the internet and apps and all that, all that kind of stuff. Things are getting cheaper. The bandwidth is getting better. Uh, and that's happening across the world, not just in India, but many other parts of the world as well. So what does that world look like when suddenly you go from 3.5 billion people on the internet to 6.5 billion people? Right? It's a very, very different world. So just because you have some great brand that is strong today on the internet today of three and a half billion people, these next three billion have never used your brand online. They've never sent you know, anything to your, any credit card to your e-commerce site. They don't know your brand. They haven't opened an account on your, on your site. So it's really something to think about for your companies, anyone in this room thinking about a startup or a large company, wherever you are, how do you scale to service this next 3B, this next 3 billion? That's something that I think a lot about. And there's a lot of opportunity there to change the world. We know that people's GDP, people's GDP per capita, their individual GDP per capita goes up by 3x in the first two years after they're connected on the internet. Goes up by 3x. So imagine. Um, I was down in Kerala, just to go back to Kerala for a second, I was with some fishermen, and I was asking them how, I saw them with some smartphones, how they use their smartphones. And they said, oh, it's very easy, Jack, let's tell you what we do. We go out fishing, uh, and by the way, there's multiple kinds of fishermen. Do people know the fishing, what happens there, right? So the St. Thomas fishermen fish how? They don't fish in boats. How do they fish? Nets, that's right, nets go up and down. But other fishermen, they have boats, and they go out in the boat, and they get the fish, and what do they do? Before they come back, they send what to the buyers on land? They send photos of all the fish to the buyers on land. They are sold completely out by the time they come back. right? So they're using smartphones. So that means you have to have a smartphone. And in many of the countries that we visit, what we're finding is the use of smartphone It's not just, oh, it's a fun communications tool. I'm doing social media. I'm typing memes, things like that. No, it is a core tool of commerce. It is a, it is a tool of livelihood. So it's a very, very different mentality than for us who may have 17 million devices, laptops, things like that. This is the device. This is it. So we think a lot about that. Um, 
We look at a lot of different ideas every single year. A few of them actually make it through. These are some of the recent graduations. Uh, and so Waymo, self-driving cars graduated. Verily, Life Sciences graduated, Google Brain. Loon is a wonderful technology with balloons to uh, be able to access the internet where there's no possibility of running fiber and things like that. Uh, Chronicle is a wonderful cybersecurity company. Wing is uh, self autonomous drones. Uh, so lots of, lots of ways to, for us to graduate stuff. And we basically analyze um, how do we de-risk right up front in the early stage? We want to look at these ideas very early and find out which ones we should focus on and which ones we should not focus on uh, going forward. And so there's a lot of activity there. Loon, I just mentioned the balloons. That's an example there. Here you see it at 65,000 feet. It is, um, today it's 4G technology, 4G LTE. So your cell phone believes that there's a cell tower up there. It doesn't know it's on a balloon 65,000 feet up. It believes that there is a cell tower there because it is transmitting, that balloon is transmitting 4G LTE. Right? So recently in Puerto Rico, what happened in Puerto Rico? They had a major storm and they lost what? Right? They lost power, they lost cell phone, lost internet. We sent four of these balloons, public information, you can check it out on Google, I guess. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, and you could... And you can see that we sent a number of balloons and we repowered, gave everyone access for a number of months until the other power can come back on and people can get access to internet. So uh, Project Wing for deliveries. Uh, some people say it's for burritos, like here. I think it's more like medicine. That's how I think about it, but okay. Um, uh, and then, of course, self-driving cars. Uh, we know the story there. And this is one of the hallmarks of, of uh, Moonshots, which is when you start a project like this, people think you're crazy. People think you're nuts. 11 years ago, when we started self-driving cars, people said, this is nuts, this is crazy, this is never going to work. And now, of course, we know it's working. Not only is it working, we already feel we have succeeded because who now is in the game? Everyone is in the game. GM, Ford, ev everyone has a self-driving play. Everyone realizes this is now going to happen. We've already checked success on this because we changed the mentality. And that's what we learned is the key to moonshot thinking. It's not the technology itself. It is us. It is our thinking. Right now, there's people out there uh, starting up a $50 million X Prize for cancer moonshot. And again, the same thing. Yes, we need better technology to fight cancer, but the first thing we have to do is change our mentality. When the people in the 1910s, 1920s thought about polio, if you read go back to the papers then, like, oh my God, polio's here forever. Polio's gonna, gonna strike us forever. We have iron lungs and things like that. Now we know, of course, it was solved. It, it was not an issue. And as difficult as cancer is, we have to change our mentality. This is what we have to do. So, um, and so this is what happened with cars. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to see this evolution uh, and you know, go out there so quickly. Um, and, but it takes time. These things take time. This is what the computer sees. Uh, I recently was in one of the self-driving cars, and uh, they have screens now in the official one that if you go to Arizona and go to the live one in Arizona, you can see that uh, it's a nice screen that shows you what the computer's seeing. And I think it gives people a lot of peace of mind, right, to know what is the computer seeing, right? What is the computer seeing? This is what the computer sees the pedestrian, sees the stroller, sees this, sees that. Uh, and that is something that is very exciting. And, then, and with moonshots, people do think you're crazy initially, but then they realize that's that. Now, what famous person, maybe from India, said something similar about maybe first they think you're crazy, then they fight you, Gandhi. then you win. Gandhi, right? And so, very, very similar situation, right? That um, you have a situation where people initially are against you, they don't believe this is happening, they don't believe it's possible, and then suddenly, over time, you make it mainstream, you make it possible. Um, here's a recent example of some interesting uh, work that we published online regarding grasping for robotic arms. Uh, and we had to train it using physical arms initially, and then we realized, you know what? We can actually um, use a simulation. We can actually recreate the robotic arm in a simulation on a computer program, no physical arm anymore, and we can actually accelerate by many times. And so this is an example of moonshot thinking when it comes to robotic arms. So this is already happening uh, right now. So let's kind of get into AI now. Okay, AI, there's many different parts of AI. It's very, very confusing, it's very crazy. So let's try to break it down a little bit and then we'll get into um, what's going on. Okay, first of all, big data. We need big data for AI. Big data is not just the fact that it has a lot of volume. A lot of people focus on the volume. It's not just the volume, right? By the way, I'm going to create an app. Would people use this app? Because often I'm in an audience and I see a slide. I want to take that slide. So instead of just taking a picture, it will grab the picture and turn it into an actual slide deck, right? Okay, all right. We're going to create this app. We're going to launch it at TyCon next year. All right. Asha, you're in? Okay. Um, so... 
It always happens. I'm at a lot of science conferences, and there's a very complicated slide with lots of data and things like that. You want to grab it, but then you want it to make a slide out of that, and then you can share the slide and go from there. Anyway, uh, that technology is coming soon. That's another moonshot. Um, velocity. What if you want to do stock trading? You want to do something that is moving very, very quickly, real-time kind of trading. Obviously, that's also another kind of big and big data. The, the volume, the, the velocity is very, very high. Variety also is very important. If you want to do healthcare, AI and healthcare, why is variety important? Variety is important because if you just train your data set on patients from one particular place, one particular neighborhood, one particular ethnicity, what's the problem with that? Bias, Bias right? And so, oh my god. All right, well, we have to move quickly. Okay. Um, so let me move on now, because I want to hit some of the ideas um, about the future of AI, the moonshots in AI. We know that AI initially was inspired by the neural networks in our brain. These are neurons in our brain. You put them together. This is an abstraction of that. Um, and we know that um, you know, when we, we kind of link all these things up, cat, dog, things like that, we can train it. We can say, hey, network, I'm going to show you lots of cats, I'm going to show you lots of dogs, and then over time you can retrain your weights so that we can get it right. If, if we show it a cat and it says dog, we say bad network, and it retrains itself, and then it goes from there. Um, and we can you know, do all those kinds of features. There's a whole zoo. If you look up neural network zoo online, you'll find this zoo, this different architectures of neural networks. Um, and you can apply this in oncology. There's lots of different applications, uh, medical imaging, genomics, drug discovery, all kinds of good stuff. But there's something inherent. This is 1943, McCulloch Pitts. This was the original paper where neurophysiologists realized that maybe we can make an artificial neural network. This was the original paper. This is where it started. And we have to go back. If we want to think about moonshot thinking in AI, we have to start questioning our assumptions. Since 1943, we have essentially not changed the core of the node. I've changed the architectures. I just showed you the, no, the, mo the model zoo, all the different architectures of different kinds of networks. But we have not changed the underlying node itself, how the node itself sums up information and passes it to the next node. Maybe it's time to question that. Maybe there's a moonshot in there. If you want to collaborate on that, please contact us. I'll provide my contact information at the end. Um, we're also looking at this question the non-overfitting puzzle or the, gen or the generalization puzzle. This is a very, very deep question right now in AI. And so the question right now is, we know that AI works, we know that deep learning works, but the question is, how does it generalize? When I say generalize, I mean that you could train it on one data set, and it does well, and then you show it a new data set, and it also does well. That means it generalized, right? It went from here, didn't just memorize it, it generalized. And the fact is, it's working. It's working in all kinds of areas, but we don't know exactly how it's working. Again, if you're interested in that area, you want to collaborate on that. We're writing lots of papers. We're investigating. If you go to archive.org, people sometimes uh, look to news, to various news outlets. My recommendation to you is go to this free, open, nonprofit website, archive.org. We say, we pronounce the X as ka, archive, like chi, the Greek letter. And uh, you can type in my name as an example if you want to. You can type in your name, type in any name you want to. Um, and you'll find papers by that person. And this is really where the cutting edge stuff is shared. We don't wait to read it in the news areas. We go to archive and we share our papers and our science together on this website. Uh, it's a free open website, so I recommend checking it out. Um, uh, I do want to mention one thing about AlphaGo, which is this t-shirt. Does anyone have this t-shirt yet? No. Maybe next time I should bring these t-shirts. OK. Game 2, move 37. What was game 2, move 37? Right, so this is in the game of Go, game two, move 37. And this was a question of, um, in game two of the computer versus the human, the best human in the world in Go, it looks like the computer made a mistake. Move 37 looked like a rookie mistake. Now it turns out that 40 moves later, we realized that was the move that won it the game. And so we're realizing that Go, the game of AlphaGo, the, the player of AlphaGo, the computer, is not playing our kind of Go. It's playing a different kind of Go because of the way it was trained and things like that. We don't have time today to go into that, but I encourage you to look up Game 2, Move 37. Now, let's spend just a few moments on the quantum realm, and then we'll wrap up. So we talked about AI. We talked about two possible moonshots in AI, that is you know, fundamentally questioning the core node itself and generalization. Now let's talk about a new realm of computation. All of our lives, the whole, sem you know, whole Silicon Valley industry, we've all been focused on the upper left quadrant, classical, classical. We have classical data coming out of sensors, coming out of transaction databases, things like that, and it's being processed on a classical processor from Intel, from any, you know, AMD, NVIDIA, so on and so forth. Classical to classical. All of us in this room, all of us here in Silicon Valley and around the world, we're about to enter a new era of computation. 
an era of computation where we're not limited to classical information coming out of sensors, and we're not limited to processing it on classical. So, for example, we can go into the bottom right quadrant, QQ. This is something that has not been explored yet. So, again, we've all been in the upper left. We're about to enter into new realms. And there's three core areas of quantum information sciences that I commend to you. If you're a venture capitalist, if you're an entrepreneur, this is an area ripe for entrepreneurship, for investment. This is some of the next trillion dollar companies will come from this area right here. Three areas, quantum computing, quantum sensing, quantum communications. A lot of times people come up to me and say, hey, Jack, tell me more about quantum computing. I say, yeah, I'll happy to do that, but don't forget two other big pillars to this, sensing and communications, right? So when we think about what's needed for this is all you need is a few qubits, a few of these special little kinds of bits, quantum bits, we say qubit, quantum bit qubit. Um, for quantum cryptography, quantum communication, you only need, really need a few bits, few qubits, and quantum sensing, only a few tens of qubits, which we have today. Quantum computation, we need even more, but the fact is we can do that. Quantum communications, what is that? That is when you can send things very securely, unconditionally securely, via either fiber optics or a satellite. You can read more about that. We don't have time to go into that today. But this is causing a lot of interesting headlines around the world. It's being published in physical review letters, in archive. You can look up all this information. And when we get to quantum um, uh, computing, we can simulate physics itself with these kind of computers. Richard Feynman, the famous physicist who won the Nobel Prize, realized that nature itself is not classical. It is, it's not classical. It is quantum. Therefore, if you have a classical machine, i.e. any of the machines that we have today, then you will not be able to catch up to all the dynamics of physics itself. If you wanted to, for example, model two drugs, perhaps interacting, two molecules to make a new drug for drug discovery. If you wanted to model a new kind of laser so that you can make new kinds of lasers for various applications in medicine or other, other areas, you cannot model that with a classical computer. You'll always fall short. But a quantum computer, because it is actual physics itself, and that's the key distinction I would like you to take away from this discussion of quantum computing. Quantum computing is unlike classical in that in classical computing, we are just modeling, we are just referring to some outside thing called the actual world, the actual physics. In quantum computing, we're doing a quantum experiment in the physical computer. It is real physics. We're doing superposition, we're doing entanglement, we're doing the thing itself, and that's why it can catch up to nature, per Richard Feynman and others. And so, um, you know, summer's coming up, and I know people always ask me, Jack, what's some nice, fun beach reading? Light beach reading. Very amusing. Well, let me tell you, I have a few this year. Quantum computing and applied approach. Yes. Um, very, very light. Very light, I assure you. Um, um, this book is coming out, and the reason why we had to write this book is that the, the last books written in this field are about 10 to 15, 17 years old. And they're wonderful books, and they tell you a lot about the theory. But so much has happened in the last three, four years that as we started teaching, I'm one of the instructors in our internal university, I, we needed a book to actually teach from. And so we realized, oh my God, we have to write this book. Uh, and so the reason why you haven't seen me on weekends, nights, or any other time is I've been writing this book. Um, and it's coming out this summer, just in time again for the beach. Uh, I know no one here really likes the beach. I know we're all nerds in this, in this room here. So we'll probably be reading this indoors, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Um, one of the things we're even exploring now is, could we actually run neural networks on a quantum computer? Is there any advantage to running a neural network on a quantum computer? Uh, and so you can read about that again on Archive. And we just came out with some interesting papers here. If you again look up uh, on Archive, you'll see something about tensor networks. Very, very interesting stuff. You get funny cartoons like this. These are tensor networks. I commend you to think about tensor networks in your AI applications and your other applications there. Um, and all kinds of applications in brain imaging and things like that. So um, just to kind of, let me just finish with two things. Um, the first thing I just wanted to mention is that I'm here today because my friend Asha asked me to, to uh, uh, come back from a trip early and, and fly in and, and share with you some of these thoughts today. Um, uh, many of us you know, uh, think a lot about the legacy and the life and work of Rajiv Matwani. Uh, Rajiv was the advisor to uh, the founders of Google. Uh, and he had a lot of impact in computer science and many other areas. And I just want to commend Asha for um, honoring his life and work through her life and work. Uh, and please welcome, you know, just join me in re recognizing that. Um, 
The Matwani Foundation does incredible stuff. I'm happy every year to welcome the Rajiv Fellows every year at Google, where we host them and we talk to these young entrepreneurs and other fellows about the future and about these kinds of moonshots and things like that. And so uh, it's just, it's very um, emotional and touching, uh, Asha, what you have done uh, in honor of Rajiv uh, and that. I want to talk about another son of India, um, and that is Ramanujan. Um, among other things, I also I write and, and teach the courses in mathematics in our internal university and uh, love math a lot. And so I flew a number of months ago to this place. Anyone know where this place is? Right, Trinity College in Cambridge. And this is where Ramanujan was. And in the Wren Library, in that beautiful library, are some of uh, Ramanujan's works. And we got to get special permission to look at his works and start examining them. I did find out, however, and this is a call to action to everyone here at Taikon, that many of his works are still in Chennai. They're still um, in three different locations in Chennai, and they have not been translated in some cases. They've not been really examined. They've not been digitized. All these works in the Wren Library have been digitized. You don't have to actually fly there anymore. You can now actually you know, view them online. But if anyone here wants to work with us and collaborate with us in digitizing the remainder of the works of Ramanujan, actually a large number of, of works are still there in Chennai, please you know, join us in doing that. And again, please, um, Contact us if you have thoughts about collaboration, if you have thoughts about the future. Um, this is an image that was taken, uh, this the black hole image by the EHT, uh, and I just put it up there, not because we had anything to do with it, just because I so admire the work that they had. This was a moonshot itself, a 10-year moonshot, to bring these eight telescopes together and actually image something that was never imaged before. So with that, hopefully we have some inspiration today uh, from all these great leaders that we talked about and all the great science and technology. I thank you very much.